Welcome to the third episode of Character Evolution Cast, everyone. This episode, we have for you Jim McClure, and we will be discussing the eight kinds of fun. Just a note, we are recording this intro a little bit early, because if all goes according to plan, my daughter will have been born this past Tuesday or Wednesday, and I am super ecstatic about that. Um, and her name is... Redacted. It's a good name. Yeah. I'm really excited for you guys. I I'm know. so excited. I can't wait. <laughs> it's super awesome. It's so close. It's so close. Are you like a little bit stressed? A little bit nervous? <laughs> Just a little bit. It's going to be fine. It'll be fine. I have two It'll kids. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's it's fine. fine. <laughs> I was on a fire behind you. It's fine. <laughs> it's going to be great. And she's going to be beautiful. Yes. Um, a few reminders to everybody. We do have our own Discord server. You can join in our conversations over at discord.charactercreationcast.com. Also this week, I will be at Gen Con, and I will have some amazing new business cards for Character Creation Cast and also for Shadow of the Cabal. So you should come find me, and I will give them to you. Hooray! Well, just one, because if we give all of them to somebody, then... Well, right, I meant I will give them as in, like, one for each show. Okay, there you, you can, go. You can have two business cards, one for each show. There you go. But that's limit two. <laughs> now, now that we are Some clarified exclusions applied. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you would like to help support the show, please check out the One Shot Patreon at patreon.com slash one shot podcast. Or you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, like this one that we got from Wolfish Hunger from the USA. They titled it... Very fun session zero, over and over again. And they said, Ryan and Amelia have bottled the process that should go into every session zero. It's a lovely show. The episodes aren't rushed, and you really hear everyone and everything develop. I look forward to all the different and various systems they are going to build. Fingers crossed for IK RPG, Werewolf, and D20 Modern Urban Arcana. Now, give it a listen as they create some awesome people. Thank you so much, Wolfish Hunger. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Everybody, we are out of reviews. And yes. I like reading them to you, and I don't want to have to spend this time, you know, giving you a stern talking to for not leaving us a review <laughs> and, like, using my disappointed mom voice at you. So uh, maybe, maybe get on there and do that. As much as we would like to hear Amelia's disappointed mom voice, maybe not every time. <laughs> right, right. So please get on that. We would appreciate it. Exactly. With all of that said, enjoy the show. Character Evolution Cast, a show where we discuss what to do with all those characters we just made. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and today my co-host Ryan and I are joined by Jim McClure, designer of such games as Satanic Panic, The Terrible RPG, and Reflections. Jim, welcome to Character Evolution Cast. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. I, I'm I'm so excited, even though I'm taking, what, third or fourth seat at this point to other individuals <laughs> that have specifically called me out for such, but I'm here and I'm excited and we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things today, so I could not be more excited. Oh yeah, we are very excited too. Can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, Jim, and some of the cool things that you are involved in? Oh God! Why was I unprepared for that particular question? Um, yeah, I I, I host a semi infrequent show here on the One Shot Podcast Network called Talking Tabletop, uh, where I interview notable personalities from the world of tabletop. I am also the uh, owner of Third Act Publishing, which is a small press RPG publishing company that does wonderful games, such as as the ones that you all just mentioned. 
And then the other big thing that I'm super excited about, which literally just got announced like right before this this episode is airing, is I am also lead designer for Roll20. You all probably know Roll20, that place online, that virtual tabletop where 3 million people go to play RPGs. They're getting into the game design business, and I've just spent the last nine months in essentially secret working with a wonderful team of people designing the game Burn Bright, uh, which should be in public playtest now for those that are in Roll20. Oh, that is very awesome. So excited. Oh my god, I can't even, oh, I can't even handle it. That's so awesome. I feel like that's like the perfect work for you. Like, uh, you are pay, the ideal person to work on that. Pay, paid work for RPGs, yes. That I will always to consider that the perfect work for me. So anyone listening to this, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like doing that. Yeah, find Jim. <laughs> pay him. He'll do stuff. I enjoy money and doing stuff. This is true. <laughs> Money and or gaming, (laughs) preferably both. So, Jim, one of our goals on this show is to make really great characters, Mm -hmm. but we also want to introduce our audience to people who are doing really cool things in the RPG world. And so we want to make sure we take time to do some of that here. So we're going to start by getting to know you a little bit better. Okay. I've never heard that question before. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Why are tabletop role-playing games the highest form of art known to mankind? To, to start with, I want to tell you that that's beautiful phrasing of that question. One of the one of the best phrased questions that I've ever heard. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but the reason that, that tabletop RPGs are one of the highest forms of arts of mankind, actually, we're going to technically answer that question today. And it's, it's because I think it engages in more types of fun than just about any other medium out there. Haha, foreshadowing. Seriously, I, I, I think art is is a, to, to me, and, and obviously there, there's a, a, a thousand different definitions of art. To me, art Art is, is something external that elicits an emotion from you that's not a person, even though I guess you could maybe call people art. I don't know. The definition gets funny. I think RPGs are the absolute best medium to elicit emotion uh, from an art medium because y- you, you are both a uh, creator and experiencer in a way that doesn't exist anywhere else. So that's, that is the, the short answer, which we'll try to keep it. That's, that's going to be the theme today. Try and keep Jim short from his ramblings. Uh, but that's, <laughs> the reason why i say that tabletop rpgs are the highest form of art known to mankind i want you to know that this entire outline is designed to not keep it short so (laughs) poor choice on your end poor choice who wins here (laughs) (laughs) all right jim people know you as a gm a cast member on evil campaign a game designer a podcaster what project so far has been the most satisfying for you so the honest to goodness most satisfying project that I have I've worked on at this point has been Burn Bright the Roll20 RPG that that just got announced. It is this wonderful design space where I'm going, okay, we are designing a game specifically for an audience that is accustomed to playing, I'm going to say, very traditional tabletop. If, if you look at the metrics, D&D and Pathfinder, D&D and its various versions of Pathfinder represent something like over 75% of the people playing games. So we know that's a very heavy portion of that market. However, I'm one of these horrible indie designers, and I like my little indie designs, and I want to bring a lot of the the cool, interesting design tech to this space, but yet still have it in a very familiar place for people that have essentially only played D20 games. So it has been a really unique and interesting and satisfying experience to get to develop this game that is for a mainstream audience, but is introducing them to indie design components all at the same time bringing some brand new design tech into the RPG world. We have we have a core mechanic that is, I think, it, it is simple, intuitive, and has never been seen before anywhere, and I'm, oh, I'm so excited for it. Uh, so that would be my most satisfying experience so far. I've had a lot of a lot of good experiences, um, but uh, developing reflections was was really a lot of fun. Um, it, it, it was kind of this crazy, uh, like smash deadline together with making something that was was new and interesting, uh, and also working in a design space that I hadn't really seen before. Because uh, th- there's a little bit of backstory to it, but essentially, reflections got developed and went to Kickstarter in. Three weeks was about the time period because there was, yeah, yeah. Never do that to yourself. I would never, ever do that (laughs) to yourself. Uh, We're driving down North Carolina before Origins. 
And literally on that 10 hour drive, I designed the core mechanic for that game. And it almost did like almost no mechanics changed from that. It was, it was one of the, at this point, only times in my design career where I designed it and I was like, yeah, that, that works. It does exactly what I want it to do. And I don't have to fiddle up a little bit, except for the hatred mechanic, which I changed like six times during the process. But if we ignore that one mechanic, everything else <laughs> fell fell like perfectly into place. Uh, and then once the game got out in the world to hear so many people come back to me, you know, I, I've got several stories involved with it, but there's one person that, that, that found a date after he came to America by pitching reflections and literally is the first date they played it. I was approached by another, another person out of England who who is doing a, a live action play version of Reflections to hear that kind of feedback and, and to get those kinds of uh, I- interactions is, is very, very satisfying for me as a designer. Is hearing that kind of feedback from people your favorite part of it? I feel like it would be for me, just like hearing how people interact with your stuff has always been really satisfying to me. It's it's very important to me. I will not say it, it's the most important thing to me. I'm uh, I, I look at and, and kind of my my design space and and people are getting to know this more and more about me. I kind of have to work in my own systems. Um, I don't I don't. There's nothing wrong with designing in, in Powered by the Apocalypse or other people's game space, but that doesn't get me out of the bed in the morning. Like what gets me out of the bed in the morning is I go. I want to get this kind of feeling and these kind of emotions across. Design mechanics that do that and the absolute absolute most satisfying for me is 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 when it, it's a puzzle like it's it's a puzzle that needs to be solved I was going to say solved. you like solving that exactly sort of <laughs> exactly equation. and 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 it's when it when it makes it click it's perfect so for for example reflections uh you know in, in that that was a game where it's like okay I want you to play out essentially the three act structure in an hour that's the goal of the game because I know that'll give you an emotional gut punch like that's all I'm going for how do I make the mechanics make you as the players act in the right way during each of these scenes because it's not an intuitive thing. Our, our mind actually fights against the three-act structure. How do I make you do that? And when the mechanic came together and worked and clicked, it was like, there it is. And it's working, and it's great, and that's actually the most satisfying for me, which is very selfish, but yeah, it's honest. No, we, we <laughs> talked a little bit about that with Alex when we talked with to her about Starcross, too, about that feeling like you're some kind of sorcerer because you can make people do what you want with your game. <laughs> like, I, that seems like such a good feeling to be like, you don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> That's real life magic, baby, that I can, I can, I can type words into a screen and make you feel emotions a thousand miles away. That is, that is witchcraft. Absolutely. That is power. <laughs> oh, all of the delicious power. Yes. <laughs> All right, so, Jim, we have to have this conversation. Uh-oh. Okay, but L5R, right? It's, like, literally the best, right? It's so good. It's, it's so, so good. good. It's, oh, my God. It's, and <sighs> I, I don't, because you're, you're, and now, now we're, like, immediately going deep into the weeds because you're, you're, you're my fellow Phoenix Void Chugenja because you understand and everyone else is just wrong. Right. It's absolutely. Yes. Phoenix Clan, best clan. Yes, we were we were talking about it this morning, the cast of Shadow of the Cabal, and I said, Jim and I need to play a game that is just two Ishiken. Like, yeah, absolutely. That's it. That's the whole game. That's just it. Messing, we win messing the up the session. world. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> we won just by showing up. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's <laughs> called being Phoenix. Yes. You you, you you won the life lottery in L five R. Congratulations. You were born yeah. into the best clan. You must right. have done something good in your past lives. <laughs> But uh, no, no, it's it's absolutely it's absolutely phenomenal. Have you looked much at the upcoming fifth edition? Yes. So I have played through the beta twice, I think, and that's what we're going to be playing when we start the new season of the Shadow of the Cabal podcast too, because I'll be on there for next season. Y- you excited for it? Oh my god, I'm so excited! I'm yeah. so excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm so excited about the new edition because I think that it. It does a lot more with the social stuff that I think some of the older editions were really trying to do, but just couldn't quite get there. Yes. Because that's my favorite part of that game is like the drama and the emotion and the like the feelings. And so I think that the new edition takes a lot more of that into account. Like I'll still miss some stuff about fourth edition, but the the yeah. outbur- the outburst mechanic is the most brilliant mechanic they put into L five R. It is I love it. It when is we, perfect. It when is we played through the beta. Perfect. 
<laughs> we, we, you have the option of saying like, no, I don't want to have this outburst right now. And we're like, why would I not want to do that? <laughs> yeah, no, and that's th- like my uh, a lot of my feedback that I sent to them in regards to it is, is a hey, yeah, you, you you should honestly you shouldn't be allowing people not to have the outburst. It's one of the most fun and interesting and dynamic things. Ah, I it, it was one of those I read it and I was like, yes. Yes, I'm happy when I see something that I myself did not think about and is better than anything that I came up with. I'm like, yes, that's why you people are in charge of designing this game. <laughs> now, if, if only they would do my court battle system for social combat, but that's that's for Jim Samurai game, apparently, when that'll come out. So, hmm. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to need to know all about that. <laughs> I just, I like that when the beta came out, everybody's like, is it going to be roll and keep? Is it going to be Fantasy Flight's narrative dice? And it was like, yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, no, it, it was... A wonderful marriage of the two. Oh, it made me so happy. Okay. So- <laughs> I, I, I really love seeing both of you geek out over this game that I literally have not heard about until this year, which <sighs> is... Sir, climb you- out of whatever hole you have been buried in. <laughs> I apologize. I, I was a Palladium boy back in the 90s. That was my gateway system. <laughs> no, so. and, and I mean, honest, honest to goodness, the L five R role playing game. It's actually the card game is much bigger than the role playing game yes. ever was on it. But it, it's one of those where it, it it does have a small player base, but as you can tell, a very a very loyal player base who makes outrageous accusations about it, like it's the greatest game ever made. <laughs> oh yeah, it's we have a lot of feelings. Like it's it's so oh it's so good. It's, it's so good. so good. <laughs> I, I Just, thoroughly enjoyed creating characters for fourth edition, and I'm really looking forward to fifth edition too. So, yeah, did did you good. all did you all break it in the way that you actually in the fourth edition? Uh, just based on how the math and the rules, you can start as a level two character without like any really gaming the system that much. We all got pretty close. Yeah, yeah. You can you can full on and and for those who don't know, there's only five levels in the game, and you can actually start as level two, uh, based on a formula and a way to buy. It. Essentially, it requires buying a bunch of level one skills. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, because the insight calculation is just silly. Uh, it, it, it's a good concept that has some execution problems. Uh, th- that is like the subtitle of that game. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I do. L five R. It's. It was a good idea. <laughs> I I do a conversation. I do a, a, a seminar called the Art of Mechanics. Uh, I've I've done it a couple times at Origins and Gen Con and Metatopia, and uh, I I talk about Fourth Edition L five R because of course I do, and it, it's it's one of the things I talk about where I go the the honor mechanic is what what ties. Oh ties that entire system together but it's so underpowered it doesn't actually work uh so therefore the whole system falls apart but if it actually worked it would be amazing and most of us just treat it that way because the honest reality is the reason everyone upholds to honor is not so much the mechanic to it it's you've invested so much of your life reading and learning and wanting to play a proper samurai that you want to play a proper samurai and that actually holds more weight than the mechanic but I, I can't give that proper points for good mechanical design when oh they should fix that slightly but that's again Jim samurai <laughs> version honor will have a lot lot stronger focus on it yeah, and I think it does in the new game, if I remember yep. correctly, that it does a lot yep. more. But we we talked about that when we were creating characters, too, because Ryan said, so I assume honor's really important. And I was like, you would assume <laughs> that, wouldn't you? <laughs> like, it tells you it's very important, but mechanically right? yeah, mechanically speaking, it's not. Yeah. yeah. You use it for, like, almost nothing. Exactly. But yep. that's okay. Yep. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having that moment yes, with me. I know. Ryan, you can ask your next question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess without getting into too much detail, since we're going to be covering it later, what is your type of fun, Jim? Ooh, and and this is really interesting. So we're we're going to get get into it because we are going to talk about the eight kinds of fun today. And there's two things I have to say up front before I can answer that question. First being that I believe every single person enjoys all eight kinds of fun. It's one of the core underpinning traits. So everyone enjoys those. And within the world of tabletop, what I've kind of discovered is it seems that most people have two of them that sit higher than anyone else. That's not 100% universal, but how I personally look at players um, and and how I, I shouldn't say judge players, but I totally judge players based on this, is is I kind of pick two. So I describe myself as I am a narrative expression player. And when we have our our little little moment where we're going to figure out what you all are, we're going to figure out what two traits we assign to you and what kind of players you think you are. But yes, I I am narrative expression. Expression, and we'll get into, of course, what all that means. 
All right, now that we know a little bit more about you, Jim, we are going to get into the really fun stuff. Our goal with these episodes is to help people become the best possible players at the table. And there is tons of GM advice out there, and not nearly as much for players. In our regular show, we cover how to make great characters. Now we want to cover how to play them. In this episode, we are going to talk about different ways people interact with games and how you can understand your preferences as a player and how to use those to push you toward a better, fuller experience. One great approach that we're going to talk about today is through a game design theory called the Eight Kinds of Fun. Can you go ahead and uh, start us off with an outline of what these eight kinds of fun are, Jim? Absolutely. So so to start with, I, I want to give, give everyone a little bit of information as far as where this comes from. And this comes from a document called the MDA, a formal approach to game design and game research. This is a wonderful document. I typically reference this more out to the game design community, but it is a fantastic read if you're a player. And one of the, the it has sort of two big concepts in it, one of which we're going to talk about today, which is that there are eight kinds of fun and there are eight kinds of ways that people enjoy experiencing games. So where this comes from is it, it is three people that got together. Uh, sort of the main one, uh, his name is Mark LeBlanc, and he's a, a, a MIT researcher, and this is sort of part of of early stages of figuring out, again, a formal way to go into game design as opposed to just like a, well, we like Mario moving from the left to the right and jumping. That seems fun. Uh, people kind of wanted <laughs> like a little bit more in depth as far as like science behind this whole thing. Uh, so they put together this research paper called an MDA formal approach to game design. Uh, and as I said, one of the things it posits is that there are eight kinds of fun. There are eight ways that people interact with games that make up fun. And I think this is, I consider this the basic fundamental building blocks. Like there's there's a lot of other approaches out there, you know, starting at a most basic level. Our, our friends over at the RPG Academy always say, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. And then Jim McClure mutters under his breath, yeah, but which of the eight kinds of fun? Because there's eight different kinds. But a lot of us <laughs> say we, we want to have fun and we know what fun is, we know what it feels like, and we know what not fun feels like. But we have a lot of times a hard time expressing why we did or did did not like something. And then, uh, you know, one of the, the common theories is sort of the three player types that came out from that, which is the, what, what are they called? The, the gamist, the simulationist, and the narrativist, I think is is what that three, someone will correct me if I'm wrong on that, which I think is, is close. It is more detailed, but it's not all the way there. And what we find out is that if you engage and look at these eight kinds of fun, you can start really telling what aspects of tabletop play you enjoy, and you can start seeing it with your players as well. Uh, or, again, we're talking four players at this point, you can start identifying what types of campaigns, what type of games you enjoy playing based on which ones are engaging with you. So we're going to kind of, again, to, we'll give a quick rundown, and then I guess maybe we'll talk about them individually, because there's a lot of good things to talk about individually. But to give you the eight in quick succession, they are sensation, fantasy, narrative, challenge, fellowship, expression, discovery, and submission. So those are the eight ways that we engage with a game that are fun. Uh, and as I said before, I posit two, two things. One, every single person enjoys all eight of these. And everyone's going to have certain ones that are higher. It seems like two seems to be the magic number. Most people have two that are like, yes, these are the things that if I do these things, they're great. But as we talk about each one you are probably going to realize both in yourself and in other people that you have played with, like, oh yeah, I saw them doing that and I never understood why that makes total sense to me now. They were engaging in the discovery type of fun or whatever your, your specific example might be. Our goal of this is going to be to help you as a player identify, as we said, what you like enjoying in games and hopefully give you some vocabulary to be able to discuss that. Usually we see this kind of directed at GMs and they're encouraged to understand this um, in particular to kind of set up a campaign that appeals to their players and to work those ideas into it. But how can we as players use this to understand what would further our experience? Okay, uh, so the, the best thing I want to do is is give and let's give an example here okay and and th th this will land for some of you and not for others uh have you ever been a player in a game 
And the GM has kind of actively kept asking you like, hey, tell me about where you come from and your history and your geography and all of that fun stuff. And you're just like, a, ah, I don't really want to do that chore because it feels like a chore to me. But everyone else really likes it and those other two players really enjoy it. Well, the reality is they're probably actually triggering off of the discovery type of fun. But for you, that's something that rates very low. You're not interested in, in, in uh, you know, going through this, you know, geography space and what city and what town did I come from and how many people are in that town and what's around the bend, so to speak. And that's not interesting to you. You don't necessarily know why and you're not really sure why they're interested in it. But through understanding the eight kinds of fun, you can start realizing like, oh, that would trigger off of this kind of fun. And maybe that's just not something that I'm interested in. And what this will allow you to do is to sort of understand that at a much deeper level level. Prior to the show, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, beforehand. This is not 101 level play theory. This is more like a 301 level play theory. So this is going to be pretty, pretty high concept for some stuff on it. But I do think once we kind of get into it, you'll start seeing how all of this will click and how all of this will apply to help you be a better player. When I think about it from my personal experience, I played in a game with people who really loved like the sort of combat simulation Mm -hmm kind of games. They did a lot of wargaming, miniature gaming, that kind of stuff. And so when we played, it was just like combat, okay, long rest, combat, long rest. And I was like, this is not fun. And everybody else around the table is feeling like they're having a really good time. And I'm like, this is not, I I don't care like how many squares on the grid we have to go to get to this. Like, this is not what I wanted this to be. And so for me, finding a group that played in a very different way was this realization of like, we are all playing tabletop games. We are all playing role-playing games. You guys are playing D&D. I'm over here playing D&D. And my D&D looks nothing like Mm -hmm. yours Mm -hmm. because I'm engaging with it in a totally different way because that was not what I wanted. What I want is to role-play and tell a really cool story. I don't care about your grid map like that's not for me but for some people it is like they really love that and so they can find that game that works well for that situation absolutely and and we will we'll we'll talk about just that specific situation it should be no shock at all that obviously you're queuing in on the challenge type of fun and we can start obviously figuring out where 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 your particular likes and interests are but i I do want to note one thing i think this is why this conversation is so important for tabletop and why in tabletop rpgs we kind of have this conversation that doesn't really happen in other versions of games you don't really hear that many people in in the video game world in the board game world going I mean everyone has like the types of video games they play you know oh, I like MMOs or I like this or I like that because they've broken those down and an MMO only engages in a couple of these eight types of fun a board game you know only engages in a couple of these types of fun you know a big strategy board game engages in a couple and a light fun party game engages in a different couple but you're really getting that same experience for it Tabletop RPGs, most of them can engage in, I'm going to say, seven of the eight. We're going to talk about there's one that I don't think Tabletop does very well. And it's actually the, I'm going to say it's the holy grail of game design. Just no one realizes it yet. (laughs) And that's a different discussion for a different day. But it's part of the reason (laughs) that we have all of these long discussions on like, well, what type of game are you playing? Because exactly like you said, people are playing D&D entirely differently. And that's because there's seven of the eight kinds of fun that D&D can engage with, which ones are the core focus? And if you're not interested in those, you're going to have a boring time while other people are having a great time. Yeah, definitely. In a traditional sense, we often think of the GMs as being kind of in charge of the Mm -hmm. game. So what sort of advice would we have for players who look at this list and realize that a game they are playing isn't engaging them in their preferred ways? Yeah, so so the advice would be is is and I, I think sort of one of the next steps we should do is is kind of go through and, and discuss a little bit more uh, in depth about these eight. But the thing I would say is a lot of times a lot of GMs legitimately I'm going to say try that they go, hey, what kind of game are you all interested in playing? And typically we come down to one of a couple different answers, which is, oh, I want a combat heavy game. Oh, I want a role play heavy game. I want political intrigue. I want a mystery. I want a quest. And these are 
okay at describing them, but everyone listening can probably right now think of a game where it's like, yeah, I want a political intrigue game, and then we play political intrigue, and it just didn't land with you, and you might not be able to explain why. What we're going to do here is to give you very specific vocabulary that you can go to your GM and go, I like to play in these types of environments because that's what what Jim goes is is Jim Jim as as discussed I am a a narrative expression type of player so when a GM asks me what type of game are you interested in playing I go I want a game uh, I I don't care whether what it, it, it's a quest or whether it's political intrigue or whether it's combat heavy none of that actually really the end of the day matters to me what matters to me is do we have a cohesive story with a beginning middle and end and can I express the kind of play and the kind of character that I want to play. Those are the two things that matter. Those can fit into many different ones, but if I don't have those, even if it's a political intrigue, which is my bread and butter, if I don't have those, I'm not having a good time. So now I can go to my GM and go, here are the things that I want. You know, I want a cohesive story because I am very keyed into the narrative type of fun. If we don't have a cohesive story, if we're honest to goodness, if we're letting every single player add whatever they want to the story willy nilly and it never progresses past act one, I'm going to stop having fun. So I'm not a person that necessarily enjoys games that give a lot of creative control to the individual players. I kind of like those in in a one shot type setting where you're not really going to get a whole story but for longer games Jim McClure doesn't like those because I'm so keyed into a specific aspect of the narrative type of fun and those are the kind of things that we're going to learn about I feel like this is a good place to have this discussion because I want to talk about how people can figure out what kind of fun Mm -hmm. really speaks to them and so I think the best place to start is to kind of go into each of them and figure out what they are let's absolutely do it does everyone have their pens and pencils ready because there's going to be a test at the end Uh yes (laughs) all right so here we don't think that i won't write up a pop quiz for people to take (laughs) because i will do it you should test your audience and if they get below 70 percent, fire them as a listener i i i wholeheartedly endorse that all right okay so let's do it let's do do the rundown here so first one let's talk about is sensation. Okay, sensation is a, is a very interesting type of fun. Uh, this is the enjoyment of sensory input back to you. Okay, this is music. This is minis on the table. This is you, you, you see people that love to paint minis and miniatures. They're, they're, it's that tactile enjoyment. It's hearing the dice hit the table. It's playing music in the background while combat's going on. All of those, mood lighting, all of those are sensation type experiences. And it, it's one of the, the core, again, the eight ways that we engage in actually fun is getting that sensation input. A couple wonderful examples from this. Uh, we, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very involved. I play a lot of games on Roll20. I've heard a lot of people say like, eh, Roll20 is hard for me because I kind of like to have my dice and I like to roll them. What they're at me. Yeah. What you're at. Mm-hmm. I'm one of those people. Absolutely. I like that's the only reason I like Shadowrun. Shadowrun's a terrible <laughs> game, but you know what? I like rolling a bathtub full of dice. It feels good. Absolutely you do. It, it, it is absolutely true. And that is sensation fun. Like that is why you enjoy that because it's one of the core ways that we enjoy. Our 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 senses fire off and it gives positive signals to our brain that we're doing something. I, I'll give a specific example that I've never heard anyone call out. Uh dread. A lot of people are familiar with Dread. It, it, it's a tabletop game. It's a horror game where you have a Jenga tower and you pull blocks from it. Jenga is the only, and I believe this, only game where the core mechanics fail condition has a sensation input. In every other game, we have sensation inputs for success. We roll our die and then we count it up. It's like, yes, but when we fail, it's crickets. This is a game where everything's quiet, essentially, on a success, but on a failure, cr- platter, 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 platter. And I, I think that is one of the really interesting, unique aspects to it. So sensation is one of those type of fun for, you know, the, the people that there are people that enjoy maps and minis not because they're interested in challenge, but because they love having all of that tactile feel to it. So that's our, our first type of fun is sensation. 
the next type of fun is fantasy. Okay, now now we want to give some specific terms here. I don't necessarily agree with all of their word choice on the eight kinds of fun, but it's again, it's a wonderful framework to work from. Fantasy is not the genre of fantasy. Fantasy is the concept of diving into a world that's not your own and forgetting about the actual world you live in. So this is fully immersing yourself in the play experience because of the world, the setting, the people that you're interacting with, all of that things. It's it's uh, from a technical term, we, we would call it inside the magic circle. Uh, there's a lot of video games are really great about this. RPGs are not so great about this, but essentially doing specific cues to get you into into the world. One of the things I do, uh, this is this is slightly slightly GM advice, but um, one of the things that I do is every time we start a game, like when I sit down with my group of people, it's like it's time to play. I go, wary travelers. You all may have heard me make this joke on podcasts and no one laughed because no one had a clue what was going on, but it's a joke for me and I'm totally fine with that. Uh, but it's a concept of, of getting you into the world. And and as as L5R players, oh my God, do, do we love this type of fun? And do we love sitting there and reading about setting over and over? Star Wars fans, you know, how many books, how much information is there? How much lore is there about reading through and learning about all of this? That is all that fantasy immersion. And I want to point out something very specifically because those of you that are into it, you love it, man. You, you love reading through everything. You love learning everything. And you also know that probably not a large majority, but a majority of the people that arrive at the table uh, don't really care. Uh, they're not going to read 20 pages of stuff. You know, why would I do that? And it's because they're not engaging with fantasy in that way the same way you are. So that's the, the fantasy type of fun. It, it's immersing into the world itself. Next one we have is narrative. And this one is, is fairly straightforward, but also powerful and problematic. Narrative is exactly what it sounds like. It's the, in, the enjoyment of story. It's the enjoyment of engaging in a story, which sounds very simple and very direct. And it's like, yeah, don't all RPG tell stories? And, and to a degree they do, but here's... <laughs> eh, good ones, good RPGs, <laughs> good play experiences, at least for me, because I'm a big narrative yes. fan. Um, they should. They should, absolutely, they should. Uh, so, but here's here's the, there's a couple fascinating things about, about narrative. We have been bombarded with narrative since essentially the first day you were born. Every book we read, every TV, every every TV episode, every movie, everything is constantly bombarding you with narrative structure. But we're never really taught narrative structure. We just kind of intuitively pick it up. And what can happen is if you are a narrative player, when suddenly the game is not going based on your narrative structure it starts not feeling right. Like, why Why am I just not into this? I was super into this thing when we started. We had a great direction for it, and we're still going somewhere, but it feels very hollow. Uh, for some of you, that, that may sound very familiar, and a lot of times what that is, it's you're used to a narrative with a certain type of structure, and when you don't get it, you feel lost, and you really want it. You crave it. You have that desire for rising tension, finale, cool down, rebound build and the cycle of narrative that we again get hit with everywhere th th this is a, a Jim McClure pulling a nonsense statistic out of the air but probably 80% of, of narratives that you have engaged with in your life have followed the basic three act structure we've learned to really really like it because it's a really good structure and if you're in tune to that if you very much enjoy that type of fun and suddenly you just get stalled in act two forever like a lot of games do suddenly you're going oh, why, why am I not enjoying this? And a lot of times the answer is because you want that full narrative experience and you're not getting it. So if you are a narrative player, it is one of the things to understand is, okay, uh, here's what I want. I need to formulate to my GM. I need to directly tell them, hey, I this is the kind of game I want. I want a game that has a beginning, middle, and end, and then a new beginning, middle, and end, and then a new beginning, middle, and end. And if we never get to that end point, or if that end point is two years down the road, I'm not going to have fun. I'm not going to enjoy that because it's not engaging with my type of fun. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot more sense totally than I, than I was originally thinking. Perfect. Well, that's really. <laughs> I feel like narrative is like the easiest one to well, figure I out. I always thought, well, it's it's 
the story. And it's like, as long as you're in the process of telling the story, that's narrative. But I, I never thought about the importance of the bookends in, mm-hmm. in the story. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I can think of so many games that I've played in where we've had a beginning, we've had a middle, and a middle, and a middle. And a middle, yep. <laughs> and we're... <laughs> I feel like we talked about that a little bit when we talked about, uh, you know, like our three dimensional characters in fiction and like sort of plotting things out. I mean, this is one of my personal game theories is that metagaming is not bad. Mm -hmm. When you write a book, you don't sit down and go just like vomit up whatever and like hope for the best. You plot it out. And so like there's no reason that RPGs don't need to be like that, too. Mm -hmm. And you you need to have an endpoint in mind. Like things should not go on forever. But it, from what I'm thinking is, you can have a lot of smaller beginning, middles, and ends, and an overarching beginning, middle, and end as well. I would imagine um, in this sort of yeah, little arcs in your in your full yeah. So you have yeah. like this. I'm waving my hands again, like people can <laughs> so, see me. So you, you would have this major storyline going. But you also have these smaller storylines that are, you know, starting and wrapping up within a shorter period of time, which would be probably very satisfying for somebody that's of the narrative uh, type of fun. It's the difference between an episode and a season of television. Like, yeah. And there's actually a really important thing on that. So so one of the things uh, for people that do enjoy narrative type of fun, and this is some of my, my own personal resource, because again, I do rank narrative as my top above all else uh, with expression just slightly below that. But, you know, one of the things that's interesting is the amount of time you can engage before you have a wrap up. Everyone can feel, everyone's probably at some point, again, either in a, in a book series or a season of television or even a movie, I felt like this thing has drug on too long. You know, with, with the exception of movies, one of the interesting things is uh, we kind of engage with stories. Uh, we, we have been taught that a story arc happens in about 10 to 15 hours. That's a season of television. That is is the, the average reading of a full-length novel. We've been very subconsciously taught that. Now, I personally think that tabletop plays out a little bit slower than that just because, you know, things don't progress at the same narrative speed. Uh, so I engage, like, when I'm running games for, like, 15 to 20 hours play at the table I need to have a finale. And if I don't have a finale by that time, it could very much start to drag on. Now, those are by no means hard numbers, but it is something to think about. If you're at a player and you feel like, oh, this stuff is dragging on, count. How many play sessions have you had, you know, since you had a a satisfying conclusion to something? You know, if it's been a while, have that conversation with a GM like, hey, this thing feels dragging on. Can we just solve the thing and then move to the next thing? Because that would feel really good to me and don't yeah yeah, where are you going with this exactly don't (laughs) ever be afraid for that just like no i'm fully engaged but if you give me three more play sessions of this i'm not going to be engaged anymore it's something to be be very aware of and again be be very forthright with with your gms when you're talking about this you want to be having fun don't let it not be fun to you so that's that's narrative. Um, let's let's keep it moving here. Uh, the next one is a, and then we can talk after. We'll, we'll get them all out, and then we can talk all, all of our own wonderful. And... We can talk about how narrative is the best one. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Narrative is the <laughs> highest fun known to mankind, right? Um, <laughs> challenged. This one is, is I'm going to say, also fairly straightforward, which is it is the concept of you enjoy winning. You enjoy overcoming. You enjoy, you know, through, through your own, whether it be choices or your own strategies, you enjoy being beating the challenge. This is the excitement from slaying the dragon. This is the excitement from min-maxing your character to the point where it's the best it can possibly be. It's so good. And it's so enjoyable to just win at times. Um, and this is this is challenge. Now, there's interesting pitfalls that that come into challenge because challenge is a funny thing that we have to deal with because we only as humans understand overcoming a challenge if there is loss involved with it. 
it it's why we need to fail rolls in D and D. It 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 it's why we need that we need to sometimes lose combats and we need to have lost to feel like we have succeeded. And the example that I give, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, is a very very common very good game system. A lot of people listening to this have probably played Powered by the Apocalypse games. A lot of these games go to very extreme pains to make it so that you never really fail. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is you'll hear people go like, eh, the game systems just don't grab me. And a lot of times when I hear that, it's because challenge players aren't really getting engaged with power with many Powered by the Apocalypse games. Now, Powered by the Apocalypse games are great for... Two of the three acts of narrative, they're great for fantasy, they're amazing for expression, they're pretty good for discovery, they do a lot of really good things, but they have kind of, they've kind of really cut off the thing that makes challenge satisfying, so a lot of challenge players don't enjoy those type of games. Um, because again, if you're always succeeding, it doesn't feel good to a challenge player to succeed. So if you enjoy challenge, if you enjoy overcoming, uh, you know, my biggest advice for it is like, don't see that. It, it, it's kind of weird. Um, I, I, I hate that I see our RPG community in, in two halves, um, but I still kind of do, which is your traditional RPG players who play D and D and Pathfinder in these games and challenge feels like a given on those games. Like that's just part of the accepted experience to many of them, not all of them. And then I see the, the, the indie designers and the indie game players who go like, no, I don't like challenge. Isn't a thing that I want to in, engage with and enjoy with, but it, it is a very interesting concept. And if you enjoy challenge, don't ever be scared to go to your GM and be like, like, yeah, I want a fight that's hard. I want, you know, circumstances that, you know, I have to, you know, skin of my teeth win. And if I don't get that, I'm not having fun. Likewise, make sure all of your other players are on board with that type of experience. Because, Amelia, you were given the, the situation where you were seemingly with a group of challenge players who were loving it, but you don't sound like you're a challenge player. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, and that's, you know, I'm sure a thing that we'll talk about at some point, too, here is that I am certainly not against those sorts of things. Like, I, we've talked about how much we love L5R, and L5R certainly has, like, those challenge components to it. Do I love that game? Yes. Is that my favorite part? Definitely not. Mm -hmm. But in small bits, I'm perfectly happy with, you know, any of these kinds of things because... I can engage with them. They're just not my top choice. If you asked me to rank them, that would be toward the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is it horrible? And like, does it make me sick to have to do it? No, but it's just not like that great, you know? Exactly. And and never look at, at any of these as if they are a problem. Uh, one of the things I, I see people sort of say and do a lot is they talk about, uh, you hear advice of like, oh, it's a min-max player. Like, you know, he's min his character to some sort of absurd level. Like, ah, oh, just get over yourself. Don't do that. And what I would like to express from this is they are engaging with their type of fun, which is just as legitimate as us wanting to engage in our narrative type of fun. Mm -hmm. To tell them, no, you're wrong, you're bad for doing that, is to try and tell them that the thing they're engaging with is wrong, and that's just not, A, it's not reality, B, it's unfair to them. Um, so understand, you know, oh, you have a challenge player that you're playing with, they enjoy this type of stuff, work with that, celebrate with that. If you were a challenge player, you know, understand that. Talk to your GM. Talk to your other players. Like, hey, this is something that I do, and this is something I'm enjoying doing, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's what you enjoy. Well, yeah, and I, I think not everything has to be for everyone. Bingo. You know, like I said, at that previous table, like, they were all having a great time. That's fine. That group was not the group for mm -hmm. me, and I'm okay with that. That's, you know, they are lovely people, but that was not the game that I was interested in playing. And that's totally acceptable, like we said before, too. If you're having fun, you're doing it right. But you can have fun over there, and I can be, like, not interested in that kind of fun, and it is not a judgment on you as a person or on that game system or anything like that. It's just, it's not for me. That's fine. You are more than welcome to continue to exist, <laughs> just, like, over there. Exactly. Not where I am right now. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so that that's challenge type of fun. Let's let's move on from there. Fellowship. 
fellowship is a really interesting and a really powerful one that a lot of people don't necessarily realize. And fellowship is just the enjoyment of doing something together as a social group. Okay, Mm -hmm. this is we are coming together and we are all getting together on Friday night and we're going to have have Mountain Dew and Reese PCs, which every time I say that sounds derogatory, but I go, that's legitimately what I do. So, like, I love it. I don't care. But uh, it's it's the enjoyment of just coming together with a group of people and doing something. And that in and of itself is fun and it's engaging. I'll actually once we get through all that, I'll, I'll tell a story about one of my players who who very much engage with the fellowship type of fun. The, there's some interesting things to realize about this. You, you, you may have, have, have heard some of your fellow players, or you may yourself be this way, who's they're the ones that are like, every time people ask, like, well, what did you know? What did you like, what you didn't like, etc.? They go, oh, I loved everything. It was great. And every game they've ever played, they loved everything because they're in a room with four to five of their friends doing something together. Mm-hmm. And that in and of itself is as good of enjoyment as I get from a successfully ex- uh, executed narrative. It is just the enjoyment of doing stuff as a group. Additionally, if you're a fellowship type of, of player, one of the things that that you may notice you really don't like is character backstabbing, you know, one, one person stealing from the other party members, that type of stuff, because that is getting in the way of your type of fun. You want to work together to do a thing, and you don't like when the group you're supposed to be working with and enjoying with are suddenly working against each other. So those are some of the things to understand about the the fellowship type of fun and again it's very powerful because humans are very very social creatures um but it's not one of those that's necessarily you know always at the forefront of people's minds well i think it's the reason that i continued to play in a game that i didn't love for so long like the game itself was not that great but it was like this was my time with my friends and so that part was Like, I liked that more than I didn't like the other parts of the Mm -hmm. game, you know? It was engaging with some of your preferred types of fun, but not others. Aha. Yes. 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 Uh (laughs) Aha. Okay, uh, so that's that's uh, fellowship again. Not, I don't think there's a whole lot more that really needs to be dug into that. So let's move on to expression. Uh, this is my number two. Expression is getting to express yourself or a piece of yourself through play. Okay, getting to put yourself into a game, and and this is dangerous territory because I'm I'm known as like the guy who always plays the crazy villains, and that's because there's a piece of Jim deep down in there that's a villain. He is, and he doesn't get to come out very often because I can't be a villain to my family and friends. I can't be a villain at my day job, but there's some deep, dark places in there. There's some very selfish places in there. I I will very much accept and acknowledge that. And through role-playing, especially villains, I get to express those in a wonderful, safe environment. Um, Now... There's a lot of people that enjoy that type of fun that's not nearly as dark as, as mine, uh, and I do very much enjoy it from other aspects as well. You know, I am I am a person that, if you can't tell from this conversation, I overanalyze things a lot, and I have to understand and things. I love playing characters who don't care about that, who just act on instinct and go, because that's not something I get, but there's still a piece of me in there somewhere for it. So expression is just the enjoyment from getting to play your yourself in some aspect even if what you're playing is significantly different than you does that make sense yeah i think so absolutely so ex- expression is a very powerful one uh i'll, I'll tell i'll have another story a- afterwards too about expression um because expression can manifest in very very interesting ways there are people that min max their character as a form of expression play uh again I, i've got a member in, in my home group that is that way where they are min maxing their character not because of challenge but because of expression which is really interesting so we'll move on. We've got two left, uh, and then we can kind of d- dig into what, what, whatever juicy details we want to from there. <laughs> discovery. Uh, I talked a little bit about discovery before. So the discovery type of fun is is the, the enjoyment of of finding something new or undiscovered. What's what's above that hill? What's beyond that hill? You know what what what's what's underneath that lake? What's in that chest? It, it's the wanting to find something and something new and something exciting and the finding of it in and of itself is fun you may very well be a player or or have played with people who who go all of a sudden like we're in the middle of a courtly drama and then suddenly they're looking under the bridge for stuff and it's like (laughs) 
why are you doing that? And what do you hope to find? And what are you going to do when you find something? You know, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that play. What they're doing is they're trying to find something. And the, the finding the thing in and of itself, again, is as fun as that group that just enjoys slaying the dragon and all being almost dead at the time. Finding the thing under the bridge is just as satisfying for it. Uh, one of the other things that this manifests itself in interesting ways is all the people that do deep reads of lore. Uh, lore is another way that discovery can be found. Have you ever been reading through lore and found that tiny little nugget of information that's just like, wow, that's a cool little thing? Well, that's not necessarily so much your fantasy engagement of immersing into the world. It is the, oh, I just discovered something. I, I found the, this piece of hidden knowledge. I found out that the, the dragon clan, you know, don't have access to enough fish and fish is the only proper thing to eat. So they eat goats on the mountain, but to keep within proper protocol, they call it mountain tuna. Um, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> I love it so it's much. It's great. <laughs> and, and I fully know, like, I don't enjoy that. When I first discovered that, I didn't enjoy that because that immersed me more into the dragon clan because the dragon Dragon Clan just sit on their mountains and be losers. You know, I don't care about them. They're so boring. <laughs> my ex was. That's okay. No, but like, that was my ex's favorite clan. And I just, like, really, dude, come yeah. on. Uh, really? Uh, well, like, Demo- you might as well like the lions. Too. Well, I, just, I, 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 gotta, uh, I gotta be quiet because uh, D'Amato's a Dragon Clan fan. So with their. With their Ew, yeah, no. Demato. I know. Yep. I lost this before he. I know, I know. That's, uh, he, he... I feel like this is the kind of information we, he should have had to disclose before we joined the network. <laughs> I maybe would have had second thoughts. <laughs> Oh, goodness. But but yeah, so so discovering those little t- tidbits of information, again, that, that didn't make me really feel like deeper into the world, but it was like a discovery. It was like, uh, oh, here's this little thing, and, and you just get this sudden little burst of enjoyment that is hard to express, and that's discovery fun. I just found this thing. One of the, the clear examples, which, which comes from the video game world, is... For those that have played Minecraft, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft does some very interesting things with the eight kinds of fun. It's actually why the game's as good as it is. But for anyone who's played that game and has just started walking a direction and then suddenly found this crazy geographical feature, it's like, that is so cool. That's discovery type of fun. It, it, it's looking and discovering the new and exciting. And on, in tabletop as a player, you might be someone that it very much enjoys, you know, having a world map and having it mapped out with your hex grids and everything like this. And it may not be from a challenge that you somehow want to beat the world, but it's a, I want to know that this section of the map is uncharted so I can go there. I can enjoy that. And if you do enjoy that, have that conversation with your GM. I mean, that's going to be, you know, obviously you're going to hear that advice a lot about this. Because a lot of times discovery players suffer when you start doing political intrigue or things of that nature because it's like, okay, we're in court talking to people again, and I guess it's dramatic, but all I really want to do is go dig around under the bridge. You know, understand that that's the discovery type of fun and that you want to be able to engage and experience that. One more. We can do it. (laughs) We can do it. Okay. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so the the last of the eight in the particular order that we described them in is the uh, submission type of fun. So the submission type of fun uh, is the enjoyment of whips and chains and ball gags. And it typically is compared with the dump. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got through the joke. Okay, I'm happy. Uh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> So the submission type of fun, what this actually is, um, this is the one that I do not think tabletop is good at, and there's specific reasons for it, and this is the most, I'm going to say, undiagnosed kind of fun. A lot of people don't realize how much they enjoy submission. Uh, So with all that preamble, what submission is, is the enjoyment of doing an activity uh, that doesn't require a lot of thought, but just keeps you busy. It is the Candy Crush type of fun. It is the, I'm sitting on my phone playing Candy Crush and two hours disappear. And I don't necessarily feel good about myself when it's done, (laughs) but I still do it. And submission is, uh, I mean, so many of, essentially the entire free-to-play model of video games right now is based around this type of fun. That's sort of engaging. And Tabletop's tried to engage with it. It, it, It's tried to do it with things like downtime rules, but it doesn't do it very well because there's a pretty decently high cognitive load that you have to have to do anything in tabletop. Like nothing happens automatically in tabletop. You you have to write numbers. You have to roll dice. You have to make decisions. So it's very, very hard to engage with the submission type of fun within the world of tabletop. 
I do think that is the holy grail that if a, a game designer could make a game that a tabletop role playing game that gives you the submission kind of fun, you would have a lot of people going like, Man, it's not really that great of a game, but man, I just keep playing it, you know, uh, which doesn't sound like high praise, (laughs) but that's what that type of fun actually is. Uh, So we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, unless you all believe somehow that you're engaging the submission type of fun uh, through tabletop, but it is something to be aware of. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a lot more passive, yes. which it, I just think that, you know, even you look at the size of a rule book in role playing games versus any other kind of board game or anything like that. And, and right away, I feel like you can kind of tell like this is not a passive mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. casual engagement kind of thing. Like there's too much already before you even started to really just kind of let it happen it doesn't it doesn't just happen (laughs) exactly exactly it almost feels like with technology the way it's going nowadays that this sort of fun could be incorporated into a future sort of game if you blend some sort of uh technology with like an app or something like that Uh, i'm not sure how that would work but uh it seems like it's something that somebody could latch on to relatively uh soon i would imagine and and you're you're seeing that space get explored in the board game space more and more, and, yeah. and I think it would be be well again. We're 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 slightly off topic for that, but any of the game designers listening, like ah, that would be the space that I would I I would be investing some time and energy in. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you would almost have to like I don't know what automate part mm-hmm. of it or something like that to like make it really. I don't know. Yeah, it's it, it that's it, it's what what game design is not <laughs> my like my brain does not do that and it's, it's why i say i personally think it's the holy grail because i don't know how to do it and i've not seen anyone else do it and i think it's just again i i ultimately think that type of fun is at odds with the tabletop experience because exactly as you described tabletop experience is a very active experience submission is a very passive enjoyment mm-hmm. Those are the eight kinds of fun, and those are, are how we, we explain it. So kind of as we talked about, you know, I think, and again, I do want to state, every single person enjoys all eight of these. It's just at different levels, okay? I've never met anyone that doesn't like a story. Uh, I don't think it exists. Some people might go like, no, I don't really enjoy submission type of fun, but if you, you actually dig down and look at your interests and all that, you're going to go, yeah, you have probably several downtime activities that you enjoy doing just because it lets your brain run on autopilot, and that's great for us. We enjoy that. Um, so everyone engages with these different eight types of fun. It's just at what different levels for it. So me personally, like I said, I am a, a I describe myself as a narrative expression type of player. If there is not a cohesive story, I'm not enjoying the game. It's as flat out and as cold and straightforward as I can get. As a player, though, one of the cool things, because I know that, is I get to kind of engage and introduce my own story into the games I play. You know, a good example of this, and because you've already had John Adamus on the program, and we played his game, uh, Noir World, you know, again, I kind of played the villain, but I played Aaron Cross, and uh, you can see where I make a story where there's, that is a game without a GM, we were, we're all players in that game, and I make a progressive story with a beginning, middle, and end, just through my own sheer, I'm going to say, force of will and desire for it, because I can engage that. You know, you hear people say, you know, hey, do do your own player arc. You, for a lot of times, have control over your own player arc. And through conversation with your GM, you most certainly should. If you enjoy that type of fun like I do, talk with them, engage it, make sure that arc is happening. Uh, and then the other side is expression. I I need I come to tabletop to express a piece of myself. I want to bring it to the table. I want to to enjoy it. And those are my top two above all else. You know, my my bottom ones are I'm gonna say kind of kind of ever I, I don't want to say ever changing, but uh, discovery is not something that interests me uh, very very high at all that would be sort of towards the bottom of it uh although i do get again tinges of excitement every every now and then on it and then fantasy actually as odd as it might sound for me being an l5r player the the immersing myself into a world is something that i don't really strive for and i don't go for uh and that can be be frustrating to some gms that have run games for me who who want me to do a lot of that stuff and i go no i'm i'm not 
at all interested in your world. I'm interested in me as a character and what my character is doing in the world, but it's all very interpersonal. I don't care about your 10,000 year war. It doesn't matter to me because I'm not engaging with that. So having said that, this this is our, our little workshop section and we've gone through everything. So whoever wants to jump in first, what do you, what do you think your two types of fun are? I was pretty confident before you started talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right jim does that to people <laughs> uh, well because i was coming to it and i was like oh well this kind of makes sense fantasy and narrative I, I like diving into the worlds i like having uh, a cohesive story and i like playing through that sort of story but then i'm thinking well are those the most important mm-hmm. things i would probably say my top tier piece for this would be the mm. fellowship because that yeah, makes sense me, me, <laughs> knowing what yeah, I know me about getting you together with my friends we could be playing board games we could be watching movies we could be playing RPGs it doesn't matter what we play I have tons of fun playing with them so I mean really that that's the part that that gets me going the most is having that social interaction with a bunch of my friends Okay. Uh, if, if you had to pick a number two, what would your number two be under fellowship? Yeah. See, that's the hardest. Yeah. Part. Yeah. Because okay, sensation. I can. I. I kind of understand that. That's probably a middle of the ground sort of thing. I. I like playing with the little minis when they're available, and I like rolling the dice. But it's not important to me. I have equal amounts of fun on roll twenty, or if it's just you know theater of the mind sort of role playing. That's perfectly fine with me. So I would, I would put that at about middle ground. Fantasy, see, I love diving into these complex worlds, but I would put maybe a story above that. But now when you're talking about expression, <laughs> I love diving into the character more and putting myself into that sort of character. Huh. Ah, might might be one that you need to dwell on for a little bit, or it it very may well be you you've got a top one and then three that are all you know around equal. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, it's, it's some interesting things to to think about and then look at the type of things that you're engaging with as as a player forward. Amelia, what do you think? I think that expression is probably my top one. I am a firm believer in the importance of playing things out people are going to be really tired of hearing me say this because now this is like what 14 15 episodes of me saying the same thing every single time that i am a huge believer in the importance of being able to play out really complex and emotional things in a safe space that is what i want role playing to be that is what i get the most out of when i'm sitting at a table i want to be able to like act out all of these things that I can't do other places and to sort of sort out all of those things from real life at a table. That's super important to me. All right. And if you had to pick a number two. Narrative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, can, I can see that. I, I, like, I like collaborative storytelling. I, I wish that I were good at writing, like that I could write really good stories. I can't. But I like being able to engage with them And collaborative storytelling, to me, is, like, one of the highlights of role-playing games. Like, getting to sit around with other people and all sort of collectively make this thing. It's not so much, like, the other people that are there, but the fact that we are all kind of making this thing together. And it has, like I said, I I needed to have a firm end point because I need that resolution of things. So let me let me tell you about some of the interesting ones from from that I've engaged with and within my local play group that you can kind of see how they manifest themselves in different ways and, and hopefully through listening to this you can understand as a player kind of and and start realizing how you engage with certain things. I have a player that is an expression sensation player uh, almost without question. And that combination and how he does expression is, I kind of referenced this earlier, he likes to min-max his characters, but he's never doing it from a challenge state of mind. He's min-maxing his characters not to win the game and not to win the challenge because he very much does enjoy 
can enjoy l- losing challenges. But what it is, if we're being honest, and we've had big conversations about it, is he is he's at a a point in his life where he very much enjoys the the empowerment fantasy of I get to go in into a world and I get to play a character who is the best at something. Because he needs that. It, it, it's something that he wants and desires within his world. So what he does is he goes through and he min-maxes so that he is the absolute best at doing something. Uh, whatever it is. And it expresses itself in many different ways. But for many people who would look at it would go like, okay, yeah, you, you, you min-max your, your, your level 1 Pathfinder character to have a 26 AC. Like, <laughs> okay, buddy, I get it. But in reality, he's not intentionally in a negative way trying to game the system. He's actually doing doing it through expression. And then the other side of him is is sensation, which is, you know, he is going to come to the table with minis. He spends hours painting them. He wants to see them in use. Even if we're just talking, he's like, hey, can we set up the minis and all that? And he's not being disruptive with that. He's just engaging with his sensation type of fun. So he's a very interesting person in that regard. Uh, I have another one of my players who is a fellowship challenge player. And, and Fellowship Challenges is, is really interesting, and I didn't realize this until I was a player with him in, uh, in actually, my, my favorite campaign that I've ever played in. But we hit an issue because he, he does very much enjoy, he wants a challenge, he wants to be able to best that challenge, he thinks about that, but he absolutely wants to do it together as a group. And one of the things that come, in, and some of y'all may have seen some player behavior like this uh, with, with your fellow players, or you may have even seen this in yourself, where you you are maybe even a little bit mad at one of the other players because they're not optimized, they didn't pick the right stuff, and you just lost a combat encounter because of it. What there actually is going on, or could be going on, and, and with my particular uh, friend this is going on, he wants us to work together and optimize together to beat a challenge, and that is so so amazing for him that is everything that is that is my equivalent of of that perfect narrative finale to a story arc to him it's working together and doing that and when someone is not doing that he doesn't feel like we're working together likewise he gets very upset anytime there's interpersonal conflict which kind of came up very naturally in a game we thought it was going to be great and he pretty much just noped out of the whole thing and did not care for it at all to the point that we had to retcon it because he is that big on fellowship type of play. He goes, I don't want conflict between us at all. I can't fathom that because I'm just always like (laughs) all the backstabbing. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, to each their mm -hmm. own, obviously, but I'm just like, I'm trying to process that, that like, I'm always like, what is the worst thing that I can do? (laughs) I'm going to do that. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. You know, but for some people, you know, that is what they engage with. And and when that type of fun is broken, it can be a very, very bad play experience for them. So those are some of kind of some of the the unique combinations that I've, I've seen over the years it's funny i go i think the most boring one is me i go narrative expression feels like like yeah all right you're a tabletop player jim i get it and i'm like yeah i am you know i i accept that but there is a lot of very very unique combinations and they manifest themselves in very very interesting ways i'll talk about one other real quick for personally sensation sensation is a funny one for me because i i give it a midpoint because there are some things i re- i don't care about minis i don't care about maps i don't care about handouts but i am the most mood susceptible person to music I have ever met like music very much inspires me so there's some aspects of sensation I engage with and not others uh, so yeah there, there, there's a whole bunch of, of interesting interesting information that you as a player can kind of gather if you start looking at these understanding what they are and then using that vocabulary to, to go to your GM and go these are the type of experiences I want what I think a lot of people end up in, in the trap just because they don't, they don't know any better I mean I didn't know any better for for a long period of time is going to the GM and going I want a combat focused game or I want a you know political intrigue or I want a mystery and I don't really want those things I just in the past those type things have given me my particular kinds of fun and if I can express to the GM I want a cohesive story with a beginning, middle, and end, and I want the freedom to be able to express my character how I want. 
That is honestly what I'm looking for. Saying I want a political intrigue campaign will probably give me those things, but it might or it might not. Having this vocabulary and having the understanding of these things should hopefully give you, again, the ability to, to increase your play experience and understand what you enjoy at the table. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking back on picking our favorites before, and, and Ryan, I have to tell you that I know that Fellowship is mm-hmm. your top one, because of when we recorded our Edge of the Empire stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because Ryan went first and Ryan picked to play a human medic. And then we went around the table and everyone else had chosen to play droids. And Ryan was so disappointed. <laughs> I was like, who am I going to heal? <laughs> because... <laughs> right, because like that was your whole, I mean, and every time we make characters, like when we did it for Headspace too, you had such a hard time being like, I'm not a good person. I was mm-hmm. like, Ryan, you have to be a bad person. That's the whole point of the game, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. is that you were not a good person and you you did something to somebody and you were like, mm, but it wasn't that mm-hmm. bad. And we're like, it, it was. <laughs> you just can't like, I love that about you because I'm always like, everyone should backstep everyone. Like we're all just in a circle, like stabbing people. And Ryan's like, no, let's be friends. Let's bring it all together. Come on, group hug. No stabbing. I'm going to be the medic, and we're all like, we're going to ruin that for you. <laughs> and it's funny because you're kind of blowing my mind here with all of this because I was recently in a game where we were playing kind of people that didn't know each other. We all had amnesia starting out, and one of the, the characters was a monster type character. I think it was an ent or something like that, something with two heads, and was pretty darn evil. And I'm sitting here playing neutral good. D&D, of course. And I'm like, mm-hmm. why am I not enjoying this as much? I mean, the role playing was amazing and everything, but the, that character was very antagonistic towards the other characters in the mm-hmm. party. And I'm like, yeah, there's not this harmony that I'm kind of looking for. So it's not as fun. And it makes a lot more sense now. I feel like yeah, having these categories sort of brings up a lot of things. Like I would have said before about that D&D game that like I just didn't like combat. And it's like, well, no, that really wasn't the mm-hmm. problem. It was just like challenge just doesn't, it's fine, whatever. Exactly. And and I'll bet you, you fully engage with, with situations where, where combat is part of telling the story. It's an important piece in the story. And suddenly it's like, oh, that's that's really good and interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with that because that's still combat, but engaging with the type of fun that you like to engage with. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like this life or death duel that has these this outcome eventually that decides everything. That's very important to me. Just slaying whatever dragon over there for no reason is not like Mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, so so this is this is the magic of the eight kinds of fun, and it, it it's one of those I I like talking about it, and people I I often I'm like people are like well tell me about it I'm like this is kind of a concept <laughs> that takes like an hour to describe, but once I describe it you know and kind of go through everything you go oh okay no this totally makes sense, but it doesn't have a really great elevator pitch to it, but but hopefully you know as as you all have listened to this uh you know it, it will give you it will give you tools and some understanding as far as what you can do to kind of in, engage with this further and and hopefully uh, again op- optimize your your own play experience and and be able to work better with the GM uh, where you were describing, you know, that you you don't engage uh, very well or, or you notice you've had problems when the party isn't cohesive. Have you ever gone to a GM and go, yeah, the type of game I want to play is a game where all of the party works together? Probably not. Uh, you may have. I don't, I'm not sure. But but it's not a way that people normally think about phrasing the kind of things that they want from a game. Uh, so now after after going through the eight kinds of fun, hopefully this will be something that will, will help you along your journey in, in finding the type of play experiences that you want. Yeah, definitely. So do you think that the best way for people to do that is to kind of look back on their past experiences and see what kinds of games they enjoyed in particular or are there other ways do you think that people can kind of really suss out what works for them 
Well, if they took all the notes that we told them to know uh, to take, hopefully they'll they'll have it because everyone listens to podcasts with with you know a pad and a pencil next to them. <laughs> but uh, in, in seriousness, it some of it's going to depend on on you personally and how introspective that you are. You know, I I personally believe one of my qualities is I'm I'm very introspective, and it, it comes to again my whole thing of I have to figure out how the thing works. It's a defining defining quality of Jim, and that includes for for Jim himself. You know, I'll, some people if you're you're being honest honest with yourself, you know, not everyone's that good at understanding yourself and what exactly you do and jive with. So the important thing to do is, I, I think exactly what you said, Amelia, is is kind of look at what games you, you have done and what you've enjoyed doing and don't try and within your own mind, don't try and sugarcoat it or justify it and go like, well, I shouldn't really want to win because games aren't about winning. Like, if you enjoy winning, understand that, accept it, embrace it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you're the kind of person that just like, hey, I don't really care what we do as long as there's a group of five of us together doing it, do it. Don't don't ever think that that's bad. Think that that's great. Understand. So my biggest advice is is look at what the aspects that you're you're actively engaging. Look at what happens at the table that you most come alive from, and really think about what you're actually enjoying from that, and try and figure it out. Because what it will do is it'll only help you in the future to be able to engage with those things more and have more fun as a player. And that's really what all of it is about is not even, you know, pigeonholing yourself into a particular kind of game or anything like that. But I think that you always get more out of something when you know what you're looking for. You know, like you go to the grocery store and like you are going to walk away happier if you went in with a list than if you just like wander around and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Like you will come home with the correct things that way. And I think that this is the same kind of situation. Knowing what you want is going to produce the best outcome. Mm hmm. Absolutely. With all that in mind, now that everybody that has been listening knows exactly the type of uh, players that they are and the games that they enjoy. <laughs> They've figured it all out over exactly. the course of this episode. Should players have these sorts of things in mind when they actually go to start creating their characters um, as opposed to, you know, trying to figure out what sort of game they want to play? I, I think, interestingly, it depends because you could very much see kinds of fun. And, and obviously, I don't want to say this goes against the theme of your podcast as character creation cast, but there are some players that what they create is not going to matter. I could envision a Fellowship Sensation player that it's like, yeah, just give me whatever you got because I actually don't care about creating characters. And then there's people like me where expression is my number two thing, where it's all about creating the character and it's all about understanding that so I do think for for some people it matters and for some people understand you know character creation might not be even something that you're interested in based on your types of fun and for others it might be a oh I enjoy expression in the way that I can go through and again like the friend I said that I can make myself be the best at something and I enjoy being able to be the best at something so I can play that type of character and I can create that type of character and understand that and have that conversation with my GM and have that conversation with my other players of going I'm not trying to push this game into some you know massive arms race that I'm the best at doing something or that that you know we are so mechanical mechanically good that we're outclassing all of the things we're supposed to be fighting, but I enjoy doing this. I want to be this. I want to express this part of me. So I think it will really, really, as you're creating characters, it's something to definitely look at. You know, uh, another great example of if you're a narrative type of player, which I am as well, and you're making your character, you know, one of the things that really, really helps is to, you see this in a lot of, of character questionnaires, what is your objective? What's your lifetime goal? L5R, I always think, has the absolute best for this in the game of 20 questions. It has, how are you going to die? I love answering that question so much because it's like, essentially answering that question is, how do you want to live? But it's phrased in the way, essentially, what do you want to die doing or what do you think will die? And that will express how you live. If you you're a narrative player, what you're doing is you're setting the starting point for your narrative. You don't want to have a completed narrative. You don't want to have nothing to work off of. You want to set a starting point. If you're an expression, you want to have the pieces together that will allow you to express it. So as you're as you're designing your characters uh, that, that you want to play, it's one of the things to, to really take a look at is what are the things I'm going to enjoy playing? How do I make a character that does that? And intuitively, I mean, you, you, you just said it. You, you enjoy 
fellowship type of play, and a lot of times you play healers and support classes. Why? Because you're supporting your friends around the table. It's engaging in that fellowship. Knowing that and understanding it will let you dig deeper and focus more on the things you're going to enjoy doing at the table. Well, and I I think sometimes, particularly in games where you have a session zero or something, for those fellowship players, it's really important at that point to kind of discuss your party dynamics, too, because there are... I like to play those games where there are is intra-party conflict. And so that is a thing that comes up often for me in session zero is I, I want to have these sort of hooks to kind of fight with other people. <laughs> I like that kind of conflict. And for somebody like Ryan that doesn't enjoy that, that's also an important thing to think about when creating those characters that like you don't want to have that anti- antagonistic relationship. Exactly. So, so in in a session zero, that you know, having that exact conversation, that vocabulary, you know, very much goes like, oh, well, we can have we, we can have a thing where where your character is liked by everyone, and and Amelia's character likes them, uh, but Amelia's character is antagonistic with other players mm-hmm. because then that's not as jarring to your experience. Now, again, as a fellowship, seeing players fight still might not be exactly everything that you enjoy doing, but it's also part of the negotiation. I think you're exactly right. That's exactly what a session zero is mm-hmm. supposed to be because the reality is you are never going to gather, you know, five people and a GM around a table that all are enjoying the exact same type of things in the exact same ways. So everything with it is a negotiation about, you know, what we're going to do, what we're going to engage with, and what we're going to enjoy. We, we've talked about this a little bit, but... Do you think that RPGs are better at certain kinds of fun than others? And can we as players bring additional aspects that might not be there to begin with? Uh, so yeah, so there's there's an interesting thing. We talked a little bit about it, and I, I was only being half facetious at the beginning of this thing. You know, I I do think tabletop role playing games can engage with more types of fun than most any other medium. Most of the other mediums I- engage with a very select number of these. Tabletop, I think, very much can engage with, as we said, seven of the eight. I don't think it does submission well for for reasons that we already discussed on it. Uh, but I think that tabletop very well. Does does all seven from there's a little bit of game designer in me that's coming into place it doesn't exactly uh, behave but actually tabletop doesn't do challenge very well and it's all because of at the end of the day everyone realizes that the, the GM that's running the game is making up the numbers in some way, shape, or form. Like, ultimately, you can go like, oh, yeah, I'm playing 4th edition D&D, and I'm doing the exact encounters, you know, that, that it told me to put in the plays, but I'm still deciding how many spaces they are away. I'm still deciding who acts when. I'm still deciding who attacks. There's, there's, not, there's not an even balance there, and to some degree, everyone in the back of their mind kind of knows that. So challenge is actually kind of interesting and can be frustrating for some people within tabletop role-playing games, Uh, but most people aren't going to dig too deep into that and can just enjoy the goblin fight for it being a goblin fight. So in I kind of got lost where I was going. What was the start of your question on that? Well, how can we as players bring in additional aspects that maybe wouldn't be there to begin with? Okay, yeah. As players, to understand this and what kind of you can bring to the table is is you very much can bring your own interests and desires. Now, some of these types of fun are more active and some of them are more passive. You know, fellowship uh, and, and sensation and submission are all more on the passive end of things. So those, if you want to enjoy those, they need to be more of a conversation up front and setting the tone and setting what's going to happen at the table. Fantasy is kind of a little bit passive at the same time. If you're a discovery type of player, you know, that is very much something that you can bring to the table. If you're a narrative player, that is something you can bring to the table. Obviously, expression, you know, very much are are, are things that you can, you yourself as a player can go, okay, I'm going to establish my own narrative and I'm going to have my character arc, you know, be damned, it's going to happen. That's that's fair warning. You get Jim McClure at your table, that's how that goes. <laughs> J- Jim is having a character arc. I don't care if we're playing an hour-long game. Like, it's going to happen. 
this is a game of sorry, and now we have made up a whole story about this one girl. <laughs> exactly. It is. His, his struggles very to get, serious. His struggles to get to the store and his his revenge list that he's making. But at the same time, he's also sad because his father had one and he never came back to the store. But his mother said, "Always forgive." So yeah, I'm already yeah. We're, we're already in, in, right, in there exactly. to the store. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if everybody else played that way, but like that's you know. <laughs> exactly. I know what I'm about. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. So y- you can, as a player, very actively bring these things into it. But the thing to be careful about, it's kind of as we've talked always, like you need to have the conversation with your other players and with your GM about it. Because a lot of the things, if you notice when we was going through these, a lot of the things that I kind of brought out as, I don't want to say problems, but what can be points of friction between players is when people bring these things into the game without the buy-in of everyone else. Uh, I, I use Discovery as, as, as a, a big example for that of we are doing a courtly drama and everyone's very invested in it and we turn to our, our, our Mantis Clan samurai and he's digging through the hold of a boat out <laughs> on the harbor and you're like... Jim, what what are you it's doing, man? We're having not what like what we're doing right now, man. <laughs> e- exactly, that is engaging and bringing your type of fun to the table, but without understanding, without buying from everyone else as far as what's going on for it. Uh, and the reality of that is, you're probably doing it because you probably got bored because you didn't realize you enjoyed the discovery type of fun, and you're stuck in a courtly drama. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think that there's a lot of times where you can end up really disappointed by that too, yep. because if the GM has this sort of political intrigue thing happen you're out in the harbor digging in that boat and they've got nothing over there you're gonna come away like well what was that you know there was no point in that Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. that is not where the story is it's over here so uh, not being honest about that too can lead to much more disappointment than just like neutral not fun exactly exactly so 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 bringing your your particular interest is something that you absolutely should be doing uh, but you should be doing it in a in a very direct way I mean you at the beginning said like uh, you know I, I don't think people should be discouraging meta type conversations and I'm like yes yes absolutely you're right do not discourage as a matter of fact directly tell everyone you're playing with what you want to do you know use this language to go you know again if, if I'm sitting at your table and you have a session zero I'm going to directly tell you I I want a story with a beginning, middle, and end. And if it starts petering in the middle, I'm going to tell you because I'm going to get bored because that's what I've experienced in the past. Have these conversations. I mean, we're all getting together to have fun Mm -hmm. together. By all means, make it the absolute best you can make it. If if you are going to get bored stuck in one place because you're not discovering new things, go, hey, I want a game where we go out and explore. And you know what? If we're going to do a courtly drama, that's fine. But GM, can you at least as part of this make it so we need to go out in the wilderness and investigate something to find something or anything? You know, you're the GM. You you, you do your magic. But I'm going to want that in the game or I'm going to I'm going to get bored with it and that's being honest. Well, even in like uh the courtly drama thing that you're talking about, I can easily picture that drama being a distraction for this one player to sneak off and start looking around some rooms and trying to find some actual sure. information that will help the drama progress. Well, all I can think is like a scorpion would be really good at finding those things through a conversation. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it doesn't have to be like digging in the back garden to find a dead body like it can be extracting information from people and you know there are multiple ways to do that and i think as a player being open to understanding that you can engage with those things in multiple different ways too Mm -hmm. is really important absolutely it doesn't always look the same i think the other thing is remembering that session zero is not the only time that you can bring these things up particularly the example i can think of is is fellowship but I've been in games where there's been some potential backstabbing happening and somebody has turned to me and said, hey, out of character for a moment, is this okay with you? Mm -hmm. And of course, being me, I was like, yes, absolutely do it. (laughs) Like, great, perfect. But having that moment there of saying like, is this going to be fun for you? Because if it's not going to be fun for you, let's not do it. That's totally okay. Absolutely. 
So anything else that you want to add that we maybe didn't cover here? Any last bits of advice or, or words of wisdom? No, I mean, obviously, we, we, we've spoken at pretty pretty great length on this thing. Um, you know, the, the big thing, you know, just to kind of reiterate what we've said all along, which is take a good, as a player, take a good, honest look at yourself, at what you enjoy, at what you engage with, and use that knowledge. It, it, it's tools that you are arming yourself with to have a better experience. And don't be afraid to start having conversations with, with, with your GMs and your other players that this is how I want to engage with the game. These are the things that I am enjoying uh, and do those. Uh, and I think if you do that, uh, I know for me personally, it's gone a long way in, into helping me in, enjoy my games more and more. I know I've kind of fallen into it by accident by just moving from one group to another and having this sort of aha moment of like, oh, this is what I wanted and this is what I wasn't getting before. But I think that if people have the chance to sort of take a look at it and not have to wait to stumble into it, you're going to have a better time, hopefully mm -hmm. sooner. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then actually I'll, I'll give one other piece of advice to players out there. Um, when, once you figure out what, what you do like and you do enjoy, I would highly encourage you to intentionally try the other kinds of fun i'll give you a per Ooh. i'll give you a personal story here i i challenge forever was rated very very low for me because i didn't i don't care about challenge i don't care about about beating things i i never have i've never been a big big competition person and then uh one day actually within the last couple of years uh this is a more video game story but a friend of mine was like we're, we're both big fans of, of Mega Man x if oh, anyone yes. remembers that game such a Oh, mm -hmm. such a good video game. One of the best ever made. Phenomenal. <laughs> And he, he he loves, like, every game he plays, he plays it the first time around on the highest difficulty level. You know, it's the type of, he is a very much challenged type of fun player. And I don't like any of that. But uh, we were watching some speed running videos, and I got into speed running stuff, which is another rabbit hole that you don't want in your life. But I'm, I'm, Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's oh, nuts. Yeah, I'm... I'm I'm there. Like, yeah. yeah. S SGDQ was just a couple of weeks ago. Yep. So much fun. Yeah. Um, I know. My my son is like all about that. He's like, I know about this glitch and you can do this. I'm like, yep. I don't care. I do not. <laughs> do not. Like, I could not possibly care. I love you dearly, but I don't care about what you're saying. <laughs> but uh, but but what uh, what was interesting is we were talking about it. He's like, all right, if, if you would speed run one game, and I go, it'd definitely be Mega Man X. Like, I, I've played that game beginning to end, you know, probably over 100 times. I, I love that game so, so much. It's like imprinted into my mind. And I was like, I'd probably do that. He goes, we should totally do a challenge run and just do it like just Buster Rifle only. No upgrades, nothing. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> and I had an amazing time. We got all the way to, to the final form of the final boss. Could not beat him. It's way too hard with no upgrades to beat him. You have to be absolutely insane to do that. But we got that far. And there was moments in that where I was like, Oh my God! This is what people who enjoy challenge are enjoying. Like when 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 uh, I beat whatever that one. There's that one sub boss that is just like a giant mouth maul tank thing. For those who play, you know what I'm talking about. When you're going through Sigma, and it's like when we finally it, it took us probably 30 runs on that. And man, when we finally beat that, it was we jumped and we hugged and we high fived and it was just this. And I was like. This is enjoyment of the challenge type of fun. I just had never experienced it in the right way before. So one of the things I would say is once you establish your type of fun, doesn't necessarily you're going to mean you're going to fully enjoy the others, but I would encourage you to actively try because you might just not have ever experienced it in a way that really worked mm -hmm. for you. You know what, though, that doesn't entirely surprise me because just listening to you talk about like figuring out mechanics in mm -hmm. game design feels like its own sort of challenge. It is. That yep. like getting those things to click feels really good for you. Mm -hmm. So like I think it makes sense that it's not in a in a combat overcoming this like we we killed the dragon, we crossed the chasm, whatever, but like in your own personal way in this particular thing that works for you. And for all the compliments I gave myself about how introspective I am, I never realized that until this exact moment when you said that, <laughs> but that's absolutely true. Yep, it 100% <laughs> is. Amelia is full of insight. <laughs> exactly. About other people. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for sitting down with us. We really appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It, it was a wonderful amount of fun. I was so happy to get to talk about, again, one of my one of my absolute favorite subjects and uh, also, of course, to, to get on your wonderful oh, podcast. Can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you and a little bit about your projects? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the best way to directly interact with me uh, seems to be Twitter. I am at GM Jim McClure, uh, which I'm, I'm more and more regretting that name because I, I made it because I was, I guess, known as, as a GM was sort of my first thing. But now I'm like, yeah. Oh, I guess I still do GM things, but uh, yeah, anyway, so at GM Jim McClure, that's J-I-M-M-C-C-L-U-R-E, uh, is the best way to interact with me on uh, on Twitter. You can also find all of my game design stuff over at thirdact.pub, that's T-H-I-R-D-A-C-T dot P-U-B, um, and that, that's where all of my game design stuff is. Also, very much go on over to Roll20 and check out Burn Bright. Again, at this point, it's an open play test. I think it's to subscribers only. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much where you can find me. And then uh, coming up, I'm going to have two Kickstarters this year. Uh, Domina Magica will be coming out uh, actually very shortly after this podcast drops. Uh, uh, we're going to Kickstarter on August 7th. Uh, it's myself and Emily Reinhardt have have designed a Magical Girl RPG oh. that has... Oh, oh my God. Uh, one of the core mechanics for it is... Uh, are, are you familiar with what a cootie catcher is? Yes. Uh, which is the, li- the little... Yes, yes, the little thing, the piece of paper <laughs> that, that everyone in middle school <laughs> folded up and you write numbers and you go, you know, uh, open, close, open, close, open, close, you know, pick a number between one and eight, yada, 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 flip it up and tell your fortune. That is a core mechanic of the game. It's how you do world building is you fill out a cootie catcher and then it's used oh, wow. later. Uh, it's got it's got so many cool little things to it. Do the character sheets still have you draw like your your magical girl persona oh, abso- on there? Absolutely they do. Absolutely I know they do. I didn't get a chance to play it at a catacon, but the, the other boys from Shadow of the Cabal did, and they have been talking about it nonstop <laughs> since then, like waiting for this Kickstarter. So you know, c- they're c- so excited about it. Because we because we were we were talking about it and, and, and some of the things like the Cootie Kitchen design, all that's gonna be new. Like they, they hadn't experienced that. Like I'm I'm so happy mm-hmm. with with the direction the design on this game went. Yeah, Domino Magica is gonna be on Kickstarter August seventh, and then Reach of Titan, uh, which is my uh, my big uh fighting giants game. Um, which is going to be much more towards challenge type of fun with some very interesting uh, uh, world building and fantasy elements to it that I'm kind of excited for. But it's it's a game about if anyone's played Shadow of Colossus, the video game, it is that the tabletop oh, RPG. Awesome. Yeah, uh, the only difference being obviously because it's a tabletop, you're a team of people, not a single person doing it. But yeah, think Shadow of Colossus if it's a group of four of you instead of a lone traveler, the RPG, and that's going Jim, to be in October. Jim, you're saying all the right words that. <laughs> you have the magical girl so. and you seal the deal with Shadow of Colossus and oh my gosh I'm so, so excited for both of those now wonderful well th- those again Kickstarter uh, Domino Magica August 7th and then uh, Reach of Titan will be in October we look forward to it and I'm sure we'll put it in our announcements and stuff when all of those are out because I know plenty of people who mm-hmm. are really excited about it Oh, and the great thing about Domino Magica, oh, if, if, if you back the Kickstarter, you immediately, like immediately as soon as you back the thing, we are shipping you. There, we actually have these amazing slap bracelets uh, that have <gasps> fight like a Jim. magical fight like a magical girl with the logo on them so if you back you immediately get one of these slap bracelets sent out to you for it and our only promise is you have to take a picture of it on your wrist and post it on twitter or facebook or whatever but yes uh that that is it's it's gonna be oh oh, it's it's such a stupid little thing but i'm so excited for (laughs) for these slap bracelets well thank you so much for joining us jim it was awesome to talk to you and thank you everyone for listening absolutely thank you for having me Character Evolution Cast, like Character Creation Cast, is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for today's guest can also be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. 
So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign a role-playing game. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun, it's messy, and you're invited along for the ride.